everybody. Great to see you here today. I'm really excited about the message that we have today. But before we get into that, I want to share something really important coming here to Cornerstone Chapel. It's not a church event, but we are actually hosting an event called Synergy. And it is, uh, of our, we're a part of the Foursquare denomination, and we are hosting this event. What this is, it's for our Foursquare pastors in western Pennsylvania and throughout Ohio, about a two to three hour radius from here. We're expecting about 100 pastors and their wives and some of their leaders from their churches to come. Uh, March 24th, 25th, a Friday, Saturday, coming up soon. And what this is all about is we want to be a blessing to our Foursquare pastors that are working so hard in our region here. Friday night is a night of worship where we want them to just be able to come in and be refreshed and, and have a, a time to just just to uh, rest and get, get filled with the Lord. And then Saturday is a day of equipping where we're going to have workshops where they can get some tools and practical helps on how to be more effective in their ministries, and here's where we need your help. We're actually hosting this event, and uh, we need our church to, uh, to fill some of the needs that we have in serving them. So what we're asking, we're kind of calling them temporary dream teams because it's just Friday and Saturday, and what we're asking, if you would have like a two to three hour slot in your weekend that you could just give to be a blessing to uh, these pastors, that would be awesome. And I want to let you know that you can sign up to do this. In fact, I encourage you to sign up to do this. You can do it online, and I want to show you how to do that. When you go to our website, cornerstonechapel.org, scroll down until you see it says Synergy here, and then you click right here where it says Sign Up to Serve. That'll take you to another page um, where it says, if you want to volunteer, click here to sign up. It'll take you to a third page, and I promise that's probably the last one. But uh, when you get to this one, it lists all the different areas that you can serve. It actually tells you um, the times and actually how many more spots we need to, to fill them all. But uh, here's some areas that you could help us. We need people at the doors, just welcome team, just hugging and, and hugging people and smiling and greeting them and welcoming them to our church. And then we also need people to sit at the registration tables and help them get their packets to them and their lanyards. And then we need people in hospitality helping serve the food because we're going to have uh, uh, several times throughout the weekend where there's going to be meals. And also we have a cleanup team because this is going to go like mid-afternoon on Saturday. A lot of people here and we want to get our church back for our weekend services. So those are all the areas that you could just be a huge blessing to uh, the Foursquare pastors in our region. That would be awesome. You can also sign up today right at our information center if you don't want to go through um, the uh, website to do that. There's one more area that you could also serve. We are so blessed that we have our Ignite students coming in for this weekend to help us. That's our Foursquare Bible College in Virginia. And we have a, a van load of them coming in, and they're going to be helping in the children's ministry um, and if you would like to house uh, one of these students Friday and Saturday, uh, you can sign up for that at the Information Center. And man, I think we got all our bases covered if we could do that. So thank you. We already have people uh, throughout this whole week signing up to, to help, so I want to say thank you. We had to have a few more spots, and that would be awesome if we could fill them up. Amen to that? All right. Well, hey, um, I want to introduce to you a young woman of God. Her name is Emma. Can you give it up for Emma today? The reason why Emma is on the platform is, uh, how many of you guys know we're in our Fresh Air series? Come on, Fresh Air. And last week we did uh, a sermon on attitude, and man, I just had so many people say it really spoke to them and helped them. How many of you know sometimes you just need a good joke to get you in a good attitude, right? You just need to laugh and smile. And, uh, you know, sometimes I have, I have some of those, and sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not good, and you just laugh anyway to make me feel better. But um, I asked Emma to tell us a couple jokes today to get us smiling and ready for the message today. How's that sound? Does that sound good? So, Emma, take it away, girl. What? <clears throat> <laughs> what kind of fish are worth a lot of money? What's that? Goldfish. Goldfish, all right. <laughs> what else you got for us? What games do leopards always lose? What games do leopards always lose? What else? Hide and seek because they always get spotted. Woohoo! <clears throat> All right, here's the finale. 
So this duck went to the store and asked the manager if he sells grapes. The manager said no, so the duck left. The next day, the duck goes back to the same store and asks the manager if he sells grapes. The manager says no. The next day, the duck goes back to the same store and asks the manager if he sells grapes. The manager says no. So the duck leaves. The next day, the duck goes back to the same store and asks the manager if he sells grapes. The persistent duck. <laughs> the manager says no. The duck leaves. The next day, the duck goes the duck goes back to the same store and asks the manager if he sells grapes. The manager was furious now. He told the duck, the next time you come to the store and ask if we sell grapes, I'm going to glue your beak to the ground. So the duck leaves. <laughs> the next day, the duck goes to the store and asks the manager if he sells glue. The manager says no. The duck replies, that's great. Do you sell grapes? All right. <laughs> Look at everyone smiling out there. You did great, man. All right. All right. Thanks, Emma. You did good. All right. Well, I got ready for the message after that. That was good. Well, Lord God, we just thank you for today, and we thank you for the message that you have for us, Lord. Just open our hearts. We are ready to receive all that you have for us. Lord, we want to grow. We want to learn. We want to be more like you. We want that fresh air in our sails. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. All right, church, well, we're in week number five of our series called Fresh Air. This whole series is about living the spirit-filled life instead of living in the doldrums. The doldrums is that place where there's no wind, no air in our sails. And I just want to let all our small group leaders know this week that are doing fresh air small groups that when you put your DVD in this week and you're doing your lesson, Pastor Chris is actually going to cover four topics this week in your small groups, and they are how important it is to get into the Word of God and pray and be in small group relationships, and then he's also going to talk about worship. Well, because we already covered those first three on Sundays throughout January, today I'm only going to focus on one of them, and it's the one we really haven't covered yet, and that's worship. I want to talk to you about worship today. In fact, fresh air comes through worshiping God's, a, a God's way. And so let's get a good working definition of what worship is. Worship is love expressed. Just simply, just worship is love expressed. Now notice in the simplest definition of worship, we don't see anything about God, right? Here's why. Because God's not the only thing that we can worship. How many of you know that? See, when we express our love to anything or anybody else, that is worship. Worship is just simply love expressed. So sometimes when we look at all the other things and all the other people in the world that we're expressing love to, we start to notice, wow, wow, we, we worship a lot of other things. And so when we're talking about worship, we want to know that God has created us and designed us, that, that we were born for it, that, 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 to, to, that we would give our worship to him, that we would express our love to him. And so God doesn't care if you love other things, because we will. But see, he does care when we love other things instead of him, or in place of him, or on top of him. He, he wants to be first place in our life. He wants to be in the center of our life. And so worshiping God is when we express our love to him. So the question is not, am I a worshiper? Because I just want to let you know, we're all worshiping something, right? We're all worshiping somebody or something. So we're all worshipers. The real question is this. What are you worshiping? Or let me say it even a better way. Who? Who are you worshiping? And so God talks about true worship in the Bible. In the book of Romans, he says this. He says, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing him. And then he defines, he goes, that's what worship is. He says, this is true worship that you should offer. When we give our lives to him, when we're expressing our love to him. In fact, John even says uh, what true worship is. He says, there's a time coming indeed, and it's here now. Here it is, when true worshipers, true worshipers, will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Because there's all different things we can worship, but true worshipers 
is when you express your love to God and it says the Father's looking for those who will do this, who will worship him that way. The reason I have that way highlighted is because God has even uh, shared with us how we're to worship. So we were made to worship. I mean, that's our purpose. We were created to worship him. And then God does one more step. He says, I'm even going to share with you how to worship me. And so in the Bible, he, he talks about it. And I want to take a few minutes and give you, there's a lot of reasons why we worship the way we do. But I want to just give you five today. And the first one in your notes is this. Why do we worship the way we do? That way. Well, the first one is, is because God asked for it. God asks, asks us to worship him the way that we do, the way the Bible instructs us to worship him. Now, what this means is this. It means that God, if God is God, then God gets to call all the shots. How many of you know that, right? If, if he doesn't get to call the shots, he's really not God. So God gets to call the shots, and, and he created us to worship, and he shared with us how to worship. And, and so even in the biggest book of the Bible, which is called Psalms, it has 150 chapters, and even the word Psalms means songs. In this book, he, he shares with us how he, he loves for, for his sons and daughters to, to worship him. Now, now here's the big thing. If, if worship is love expressed, and we're, we're created to worship God, shouldn't we really know how God wants us to worship him, right? And it's kind of like worship is God's what we call love language. Many of you know the book, The Five Love Languages. It was written a couple decades ago. And it was actually written for married couples, husbands and wives, to learn their spouse's love language, like how does my spouse best receive love? Because I can love them a certain way, like I can mow the grass or do the dishes, but what if that's not how they best receive love? So the whole book was based on this premise that we should get to know the love language of the people that we're trying to love, and it'll go much better for us. So some of those love languages are like words of affirmation and giving gifts and acts of service and quality time and, and physical touch. And, and we all receive love certain ways. Well, worship is God's love language. That means this. That's the best way that he receives our love. When we express our love to God in what we call worship, which we're going to learn about today, that's God's love language. Like he, he's receiving our love in his, to him. And so many times people say, well, I just, I just want to love God in my heart. Well, let me, let, me, let me challenge you a little bit if you've ever thought that way. I just want to, like, I, I love in my, in my heart. Well, think about it this way. If I would tell my wife that, honey, I love you in my heart, but I'm really not going to express my love to you. How many of you think that would go well? It, it wouldn't go too well. Like, like, I do love her in my heart, and you all have people that you love in your heart, but guess what? When you love someone in your heart, we also have to show it. We have to express our love for the people in our life. And so, you know, the challenge is this. The challenge is, I didn't have room in your notes for this, but I want to show you, we don't worship God to feel him, we worship God to bless him. Like, the goal of worship is not for us to feel him. The goal of worship is for us to speak God's love language back to him, to bless him. To say, God, for all that you've done, I, I love you and I want to express my love back to you. Now, let me tell you, when you make worship the goal to bless him, you will that you will at times just have, have a sense of his presence and you, you, you'll feel his love. And, and, and so you will feel his presence at times, but that shouldn't be the goal. The goal is to bless him. The goal is to express our love to him. And so let's look in the Bible on how God has asked for us to worship him. Let's go back to that book we call Psalms. At the very end, Psalm 150th chapter, the whole chapter kind of sums it up. Check this out. It says this. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. So when we come to church, man, we're supposed to praise God in the sanctuary, but guess what? Even outside the sanctuary, it says praise him in his mighty heavens. So out there too. 
Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him, now he gets into all the instruments. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. This is like a stringed instrument. Praise him with the timbrel and dancing. Praise him with the strings and the flute. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. And keep those cymbals going. He says, praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath. Come on, say it with me. Everything that has breath, what? Praise the Lord, man, that's us. And so that's how God has, has called us to worship him. And, you know, one really cool thing that, that we need to know, in the Bible, you know, because, you know, we have an English Bible. The Bible was originally written, the Old Testament was Hebrew, the New Testament was Greek. But now we have our English Bibles that have been, you know, interpreted that way. And what many people don't understand is our English word praise is mentioned over 300 times in the Bible. So if I could ask you, how would you define praise? Because the Bible just says, says, let everything that hath breath, what? Praise the Lord. Well, how do you define that? What does that look like? What does that look like for you to praise the Lord? Well, we would get all kinds of different answers today if we asked that. But did you know that in, in the original language, that word praise that we see in English there's actually seven different meanings for praise. That means this. When you're opening and reading your English Bible and you see the word praise, it could mean seven diff different ways to praise him. So I thought it would be good because we're talking about that we need to know how, how God wants us to praise him. Let's look at the seven different meanings for the word praise. The first one, these are all the Hebrew words, but the first one is hallel. Hallel, and, and that's where we get our word hallelujah. But what hallel means, that means if you were reading the English Bible, it said praise the Lord. Well, one of the meanings is to hallel. You know what it means? To celebrate, to rave, or to boast about God, like to celebrate him. That's where, you know, we clap unto God and we dance unto God and we just get excited about God. Amen? I mean, have you ever been to a sporting event? And like your team was doing good and your team was winning. Or how about parents, have, have your kids playing soccer and they kick the goal? What do you do? <laughs> no, you're like, woohoo, yeah, go girl, nice goal, nice kick, yeah, all right. Well, guess what? We, we were created to worship God and he's asked us to worship him in a certain way because that's his love language and guess what? He loves when we celebrate in worship. He loves when we get excited about him and that we're in relationship with him. Amen. Is anybody excited today and you just want to celebrate God? Amen. Man, we just need to celebrate God. The next one is this. It's called yada, yada. And it means this, to lift hands in acknowledgement. It's when we lift our hands to the Lord. That means when we're reading our Bibles and it says praise, one of those meanings for praise is literally when we lift our hands unto the Lord and we acknowledge his goodness, his greatness, who he is. It's when we offer our lives to him. We say, God, I just give you my life. Here I am. I surrender to you. I'm in a position of surrender to you. That's what yada means. It's when we're offering our lives to him. The next one is barak, barak. And it means to bless God by kneeling or bowing. So one of those words, praise, literally means, so we go from celebrating to lifting our hands, and now we go to, a, to a kneeling or bowing before God. All in that one word, praise, we find all these definitions. So that means we come before him and we posture ourselves and we humble ourselves and we lower ourselves before God. We say, God, here I am. Here's my heart to you. This, this is, I, and I just want to say that, that you can always do that anywhere, at home and, and, and here at church. You, the altar is always open for you to come and kneel before the Lord. And, and, and so we want to bless the Lord that way too. Oh, the next one is Zamar, Zamar. And in that English word praise, sometimes it's to make music to God with strings. That means to make music with stringed instruments, with, with guitars and, and all the different instruments that have strings that, that God loves. Man, when we do that, check this out. We're speaking God's love language when we praise him in that way. The next one is this, Shabbat. And it means to shout 
or to address God in a loud tone. The, the, the Bible says that we are to um, shout unto God with a voice of defeat. No, 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 no. It says shout unto God with a voice of what? Triumph. Man, listen, that word praise, sometimes God wants us to just give a shout of praise unto the Lord. Amen to that? I mean, anywhere you're at, like, like sometimes when you're driving, like somebody cuts you off and you're shouting and screaming at them. Maybe we need to try to praise God in our car and say, well, God, I just, I just give you a shout of praise right now. Even though this traffic's here, I just give you a shout of praise. Lord, I give you a shout of praise because I have a car that works. And God, you're good and you love me. So hallelujah, Lord. Amen. I just want to encourage you to, to all these different ways to praise God. Give it a shot. Give it a try. How about this next one? It's Toda, toda. Now this, see how this is similar to this? They have the same ending, and they both have to do with our hands. That means two of the seven have to do with raising our hands. And, and so God loves when we, when we raise our hands to him. The difference between this one and the first one is this is lifting our hands in adoration to God. The first one is we're coming and we're acknowledging, we're giving our life to God. Watch this. This is the difference. This one is when we lift our hands ready to receive. We are ready to receive from God. In fact, not literally, but it's kind of like, notice how when I raise my hands, it's kind of like I'm making a funnel. It's like a funnel, and I'm just saying, God, pour it in, man. Just all you got, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Lord, as I just lift my hands, as I toda and, 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 and adore you, just pour in everything you have for me. Amen? And I just want to encourage you, because I know I've been there. Some of you, you, you've never lifted your hands in praise yet. You've never lifted your hands in worship. And, and I was there when I was a teenager. Oh, man, I was scared to death. I saw all these other people raising their, guys, raising their hands. In fact, how many of you, you went to a church growing up that they didn't lift their hands? Just raise your hands right now. See, I got you. You just did it. <laughs> you raised your hands in church. There you go. Good job. No, anyways, um, listen, what, I remember growing up, man, I was scared to death to do it. And I saw these people, I'm like, wow. But I knew in my heart, I'm like, well, God, I just want to lift my hands to you. And I remember that first time. My heart, I think my shirt was actually moving. That's how much my, my heart was beating. And I was just like. <laughs> and I'm like, I know, like, all these people are probably watching me. Like, they're. Listen, nobody's watching you, man. I mean, just, just worship him. Just praise him. Just, I just want to encourage you. Celebrate. Lift your hands. Give a shout of praise. Kneel and bow. And the last one is this. It's called Tehillah. And it means to sing exuberantly. To sing exuberantly. We're called to make a joyful noise unto our God. Amen. Listen, you don't have to sing well to be a worshiper. Now, if you're on the worship team, you do need to know how to sing, all right? But listen, we're called to sing unto God. Listen to this. Parents, remember that first time your kid started to say, goo goo, ga ga, mama, da da? Did that bless your heart or what? Listen, that's how God is. He doesn't have to have every little you know, thing perfect. When you lift your voice to God, he is blessed by that. You're speaking his love language when you sing unto God. Amen? So I just want to encourage you. Why do we do what we do? Why do we take the first part of our week to come here? Why do we take the first part of our service to, 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 to worship together? Because God asked for it. Because God asked for it. And it's his love language, so that's why we do it. Amen. Good stuff. Number two, in your notes, why do we worship the way we do? Well, it's because praise is my purpose. Praise is my purpose. Like, I was created for this, man. I was created to praise God. Like, everything that happens in church isn't all for me. It's, it's for God. And, and so the Bible says in 1 Peter, it says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. He, he's saying who we are, and now he says, now this is what I want you to do, check this out, that you may declare the praises of him, watch this, who called us out of darkness into light. Amen? Like we were designed for this. We're called, we are created to praise and worship him. Now last week I said that for the remainder of the series, I'm gonna have a couple guests come up and just share some of their perspectives on the weekly topic. 
And so uh, today, I want you guys to give it up for two people on our staff that lead us in worship on a regular basis. Give it up for Nico and Chloe. Come on up, guys. Come on. Appreciate these guys, their hard work, and all, all our worship team, man. Our worship team works so hard and comes in on Thursday nights and rehearses and works hard and comes in early and stays for both services. And, and I, I just want to honor the whole entire worship team and, and their families and their spouses that just release them to do this ministry as well. Thank you so much. You are a huge, huge blessing to our church. Thank you so much. Well, hey, guys. Welcome to... Point two of this sermon about how praise is my purpose. So I want you guys just to share your heart on, on what this means to you and I want the congregation to get to know you guys a little better. But Nico, why don't you go first? Just tell us a little bit about you and, and um, just what that all means to you about praise being your purpose. Okay, so um, praise, there's a, I really like this topic because... I think that there's a really big difference between praise and worship that a lot of people don't know. Like Pastor Mark was saying, we're all worshipers. Every one of us are worshipers. And um, for us, for the people that are really involved in like leading praise and worship, which is different, um, there is a huge aspect that we miss where six days of the week, we really are worshiping. You know, um, and worshiping is living a life of um, living a life by following God. There's a there's a famous quote that says imitation is the best form of adoration. Mm. Let that sink in. Imitation is the best form of adoration. That means mimicking how someone is is like a nonchalant way of showing that you absolutely adore them. You love them. You want to be like them because you love them so much. And that's how we should be with Jesus. We love him so much that we want to become like him. Um, and that really shows up in the other six days of the week. The seventh day um, is our day to really show our praise. Um, but those other six days, we should be really imitating him. And that's our way of showing worship to him um, by doing what he commands and being like him. So That's good. Awesome. Yeah. Chloe, what about you? Praise being your purpose. Um, well, I've thought about this a lot. Um, there's this quote that I heard growing up that says, a song in your heart gives each day a good start. And I think that's really true. Um, when we have a heart of worship, first thing in the morning, um, worship in your heart can begin the day right. Um, and in my family, we sang all the time. And it didn't always have to be a worship song, but we were singing all the time. And um, even as an adult, I sing so much, even like around the office and um, at home, in the car, all the time. And so I think that it has a way of kind of lifting my spirit, and um, there's always a song for that. There's always a worship for that. Um, and then I also noticed this a couple years ago. Um, I was worshiping here, and I had just had this feeling like, oh, wow, the Holy Spirit is just like filling me and blessing me. And then I kind of stopped and I thought, yeah, that's true sometimes, but no, that's not what's happening right now. What is that? And as I thought about it, I realized that what was really happening was the feeling that I had was my spirit identifying with my true purpose, my true nature. And my true purpose is to worship. That's what God made me to do. Everyone's looking for their purpose in life. Well, I can tell you one purpose that you have. It's that you are to worship him. And so that was just um, amazing for me to experience. And finally, Philippians 4, 6 says, uh, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which no one can understand, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And I love that part, with thanksgiving. So whatever it is you're talking to the Lord about, whether you're asking him for something or, you know, just praising him, it says with thanksgiving. And that's, that's really true. It even says, you know, I will enter his house with thanksgiving in my heart and his courts with praise. And so um, just be encouraged that that's, that's who you are. So that's what Amen. I think. Appreciate you guys. And just we'll close with, uh, you know, I know, um, Chloe, you were part of the youth ministry growing up, and you went off to college and graduated, and, and God's led you back here to be a part of the ministry here at Cornerstone. And, 
And so uh, we just really appreciate your heart for, for God and just ministry in general and, and uh, what you're doing for him. So um, just what, what's your heart like for, for Jesus right now in ministry right now? Just how would you sum it up? <laughs> okay. Um, right now, I recently took a spiritual gifts test, and um, I got a different gift than I've had for every single time I've taken it, and one of them was pastor. Um, and I don't necessarily feel led to be a pastor in this capacity, but um, right now my heart is about small groups, and right now my group is, okay. like, there's so many. Like, we're having to, like, cut it off because so many are coming, but I'm loving that accountability and just bringing people in and shepherding them and just, like, helping them chase God's heart. Yeah. So Your heart is people. And then, mm. Nico, um, you're in school right now, and just want to get uh, let everyone get to know you a little bit. Like, what are you in school for, and what's your heart for ministry, and how you want your life to be count for God? Yeah, so um, my my story is really boring, um, but <laughs> persistent. So it started on like really early on, like eighth grade, um, when I went to camp, and I went, and then you know, obviously you can tell that I, I've loved music for a long time. Um, and I wanted to be like, like make albums and stuff like that. So um, I thought that's what I was going to do. And then I went like in eighth grade and I heard like this small voice telling me like, um, I want you to do missions. And I'm like, mm. okay, like what does that mean? The first year I'm like, okay, he wants me to like throw a Christian song on my album. That'll be sweet. So, <laughs> so then like freshman year I go back again and then he, I hear the same voice, like same thing again. And he's like, no, I want you to do missions. Like, I don't want you to do that. I'm like, so he doesn't want me to do Maybe he wants me to do a worship album. That'll be awesome. Then I'll do that. And then um, as time went on, eventually, it just he kept tugging on my heart, telling me, like, you know, I want you to do, like, missions. Like, forget about the music. That's not what I've called you to. Um, and a lot of people, that really surprises them. But um, God really has called me to people. Um, That's good. And another side of me, I'm, I'm half Latino. My mom's from Argentina. Um, and I speak, I speak Spanish. That was my first language. Um, I learned that alongside English with my parents, but really my call is to people. And I feel like what God's called me to do is missions. Um, and so I'm using this kind of as an, as a venue to reach people. Um, right now I'm in school to, to, um, teach Spanish. So my major Spanish, my minor in education. Um, but I feel like that's what God has got kind of given me as a venue um, to do his missions, to practice my language. Um, and then those other three months as a teacher, um, having off, I'll be doing missions. And I'm really excited for that. That's awesome. And we appreciate you guys. It's good to get to know them, isn't it? <laughs> Thanks, guys. That was awesome, man. Good job. <laughs> having a heart for people. That's what it's all about. All right, church. Number three, we worship him the way we do. Here's the third one, because of who he is, because of who he is. I love this story that I heard from a pastor recently about Jack Nicklaus, uh, who's regarded as probably the greatest golfer of all time. Well, Jack is now 77, and um, he retired about 12 years ago at age 65, and so he's still hitting the golf ball, but, you know, obviously, he's not hitting the golf ball like he used to hit it, and so... Um, I heard this pastor say that just a couple years ago, he was at this event where some of these pro golfers were there, and Jack was there, and, and man, when Jack walked in the room, uh, or, or he, he would hit a ball, and it wasn't that great, man, they were like, oh, Jack, great, great hit, Jack, that was a great hit, and then he would say something like, yes, Jack, and he would tell a joke that wasn't even funny, and they're like, oh, Jack, that was so funny, and I say all that to say this. He, he, was the, he is the greatest golfer of all time. He doesn't hit it like he used to, but why were they responding to him like that? Because of who he is, right? I mean, they were responding to him because of who he is. Can I say that we need to respond to God for who he is? We have a great God, and we need to worship him simply for who he is. The Bible says this in Psalms. It says, great is the Lord and most worthy of praise, his greatness no one can fathom. So we always have a reason to praise and worship him. Sometimes when we look and we're like, man, I don't know if there's anything I can be thankful for. You know what? We can always worship God just for who he is. He's our creator. He loves us. 
And he's our God. The fourth one is this. We worship him for what he's done. For what he's done. So we worship him for who he is, but we worship him for what he's done. I love this story about the uh, uh, U.S. Marine Corps Air Station in North Carolina. Um, Has anyone ever taken their kids to the Cleveland Air Show? Where these fighter jets are flying over and it's so loud. I remember the first time I took my son and I, someone told me, make sure you bring ear protection, right? And so I go there, and my son and I have our ear protection on, and it was, I was so thankful because those, those fighter jets are just, just flying over, and it's so loud. It, it'll just hurt your ears if you don't have ear protection on. Well, there's this um, Marine Corps air station down in North Carolina where, listen, th- these people live by this place all the time. And so the Air Force Station wanted to build a good relationship because they knew they were going to be loud to all their neighbors. So they just put this sign up in the front and it said this, hey, pardon our noise, but it's the sound of freedom. <laughs> and, and you know what? I, I, think, I think we need to take that same approach with worshiping God. Listen, pardon our noise. Pardon my clapping, pardon my shouting, pardon my singing. Pardon. It's the sound of freedom, y'all. It's just like, like, that, that's, like when I worship God, it is, it is the sound of, of what God has done. I worship God for who he is, but I worship him for what he's done. He's saved me, he's healed me, he's delivered me, he's set me free, and I'm going to worship him. And Jesus even addressed this to some of the disciples. He said the whole crowd of disciples burst into enthusiastic praise over all the mighty works they had witnessed. But some of the Pharisees from the crowd told him, teacher, get your disciples under control. But he said, if they kept quiet, the stones would do it for him, shouting praise. The rocks would cry out, he said. So let's not let the rocks have to cry out. Let's do that ourselves, amen? Pardon our noise, but it's the sound of freedom. You know that lady in, in the New Testament in the book of Luke who, who was forgiven of such a great sin. She was known as an immoral woman in the city. And, and, and Jesus forgave her and she ran to Jesus in front of all these religious people. And she, came, she knelt down and she cried tears on his feet. And she took her hair and wiped his feet with, 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 with her hair. And, and then she, she kissed his feet and poured perfume on his feet and all the Pharisees were like murmuring I can't believe she's doing that I can't believe she's doing that and Jesus said you know why she's doing that because she was forgiven much and that's why she's loving much and so here's the thing church when we really understand and we realize and remember what God has done for us we should not be silent we should worship God and praise him for who he is but for what he's done And I'm telling you, I have opportunities every day to fall into a funk and to be down in the dumps. But if I can just think, what do I have to be thankful for? Well, not much. Well, you know what? Start with what God has done for me, that he died on the cross and saved us from our sin. Amen? The fifth one, why we worship, is because it changes everything. Worship will change everything. It will change me. It will change the situation, it might not take away the circumstance, but it will change the situation. You know, sometimes our problems look huge and God seems small, even though he's not. Did you ever be ever in one of those situations where God seems small? Well, you know what the Bible says in the book of Psalms? It says, come magnify the Lord with me. You know what magnify means? Magnify means when you make something, it, it looks bigger to you. Wow. Do you know know how we can magnify God? By worshiping him. And our problems seem to be not as big, and God seems to be bigger, when we worship him and say, how great is our God? How great are you, Lord? And our problems seem to shrink, and our God seems to be bigger. Well, you know, Jehoshaphat was a king in the Bible that really had some wisdom on this. And it says in the Old Testament, it says, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. And they went out, look at this, at the head of the army. So you know what Jehoshaphat was saying? Listen, there's an enemy coming in. There's an army coming in and they want to defeat us. But here's what we're going to do. We're not going to put our fighters in the front. We're going to put who at the front? The worshipers. 
Let's appoint men to sing. Put them in the front. That means worship should lead. Worship should lead our circumstances. And here's what happened. It says, as they began to sing in praise. Here's what the Lord did. The Lord set ambushes against the men invading Judah, and they were defeated. When we worship, it changes everything. There's stories in the Bible where people were, were struggling with stuff, and they, they called for a worshiper to come and play an instrument of worship to them, and their problems would get smaller, and God would be bigger in their, in their perspective. Look at Jericho, where God called them to walk around the city and, and take the city for God. And it says they had the priest in the front blowing the ram's horns. And they were in the front. How about Paul in prison? He was singing, singing worship to pr and praise to God. And it said he was set free. So I'm telling you, worship changes everything. I want to take the rest of our time and give you three ways that we can have fresh air in our lives through worship. The first one is this. Fresh air comes when I worship based on choice and not feelings. Last week we learned that attitude is a choice, and can I say worship is the same thing. Worship is a choice that we make, and we have to make sure that we're worshiping not on feelings, but based on a choice. I choose to worship you, God. I may not feel like it. I may have circumstances crushing in, but Lord, I am going to choose to worship you for who you are, for what you've done, because that's what you've asked for, because it's going to change everything. Lord, I'm going to worship you. Look at this verse in Habakkuk. It says, though the fig tree does not bud, there's no grapes on the vines, the olive crop is failing, and the fields aren't producing any food. And then it says, though there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, man, it's bad. Look at this. Yet I will choose to rejoice in the Lord, and I'll be joyful in God my Savior. Amen? Amen. Amen. The New Testament says it this way. It says, our sacrifice is to keep offering praise to God. Like Jesus already gave his sacrifice to us, his life. You know what our sacrifice is back? Well, it's to keep on praising him. By choice, I'm going to do it. Number two, I get fresh air back in my sails when I worship with everything I have. I mean, I'm going to give them my all. I'm not going to hold back. I'm not going to give them token stuff. I'm going to give them everything I have. I love this story in the Old Testament where King David, he really messed up. He counted the army. God said, don't count the army. He counted the army. And because of that, there were repercussions and, and people started to die. And David knew that it was because of his sin that all that was happening. He came before God. He goes, God, please, enough is enough. Please stop this. Please. God said, you want this to stop? You have to worship me then. Worship. And he goes, I want you to go worship. Go find Aruna. He has a threshing field. Go build an altar and worship on his land. So David's going to find Aruna, and he finds Aruna threshing wheat at the threshing floor. And he goes, and he goes, Aruna, I want to buy this field so I can build an altar to worship God. Aruna goes, oh, you, you're the king. You don't have to buy it. You don't have to give me anything. I'm going to give it to you. You're the king. And David said, no, no, you don't understand. When, I, when we worship, it's got to cost me something. There's a cost to worship. And here's what he said. He says, no, I insist on paying you for it. I'm not going to sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. See, worship should cost us something. I mean, we, we, we begin our week with it. We begin our day with it. You know, it, it costs us something that people might not understand. We, we, we worship when we don't feel like it. The cost of just, you know, we, we just give everything to the Lord. The New Testament says it this way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Just give him everything. And fresh air comes into us. Thirdly and lastly, fresh air comes when I worship expecting God to respond. I expect God to respond. How can we do that? Well, because the Bible says this. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Why? Because he wants his presence to dwell in us. 
And we need to understand that his presence is what we need every day of our life. Now, here's the thing I want to leave you with today. Because some, pe- some people could look at this verse and say, what do you mean God comes near me? Isn't he everywhere? Yeah, there's actually this word. It's called omnipresent. It means God's everywhere at, 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 at all the time. In fact, the Bible says that, like, where can I run where God isn't? Like, if I go here, God's there. If I go here, God. Well, what does that mean? Well, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's in Africa right now. He's in Australia right now. He's in Cleveland right now. But, you know, there's a difference between omnipresent and the manifest presence of God. And that's what we seek when we come near, when I, when I come near to God, when I do some of these things that we learned today, when I kneel before him, when I lift my hands to him, daddy, daddy, father, just like a child would lift their hands to their dad, dad, pick me up, hold me. That's what we're doing when we worship, when we sing unto him, when we celebrate and shout with praise. When we worship him, what we're doing is we're coming closer to him and he is meeting us and coming close to us so it's not about feeling it's about knowing that he's with us and that's where we want to be in our relationship that god i know i know that you're with me amen church Amen. amen let me pray for you today that we will continue to grow to be fresh air people through worshiping god his way let's pray